We finished Sefer Shmot this uh, week. We starting Baruch Hashem Sefer Vaikra with the Inyanim of the Mishkan. Mishkan is a temporary temple that they move with them. I saw a Midrash that speaking about Moshe Rabbeinu when they made everything, the Mishkan, that there were people who said that one to each other, believe it or not, it's hard to believe, but if a Midrash says it, that's what happened. Uh, one said to the other, did you notice that Moshe Rabbeinu put some weight on himself? So the other one said, of course, what do you expect? He received all the money. He has to eat, no? I thought there's only fools in this generation who talks like this. But even in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, they suspected him to be a thief. Can you believe that? Knowing Hashem spoke to him, knowing Hashem nominated him to be the, the leader, the leader of the most important people in the world, there were still some fools out there that was, were, had the guts to speak Lashon Hara about him. How to believe? Today you find all kinds of uh, foolish people that speak against the biggest rabbis in the world. They have opinions about everything they say. What do you expect? The level of the people is very low today. No, so they make very stupid mistakes. 3,300 years ago, a generation held the voice of Hashem. You don't expect to do such things. When did the people realize, those people who started to speak against Moshe Rabbeinu, when did they realize that Moshe is 100% clean? When they saw the Shekhinah, the Shekhinah, the spirit of Hashem, came into the Mishkan. If it was done by a thief, what Shekhinah comes there? What Shekhinah would come? If Moshe would be, his hands wouldn't be clean, then you wouldn't see the Shekhinah. Shekhinah, it's, it looks like a cloud, you know, like smoke out there, you know. So this is the Shekhinah. Obviously, you cannot see Hashem. But this is what the parasha said, that by uh, Anan, it's like a cloud. It's coming on, and everybody feels the presence of Hashem there. From here we learn that if a person steals money and build a shul, what uh, blessing you expect to have in this shul? If it's done from stolen money. That's why holy people that used to receive from this kind of people money, they used to separate between clean money and non-clean money. You may ask, how did they know? There's two ways to know. One is to see how the person who gives you the money looks and dress, how he talks. You can ask a few questions about him and you know more or less who he is, religious, not religious, honest, not honest. You hear, you check about him. And second, you just see how he looks. You see, no keeper, his sideburns are cut. You see the way he dresses, 100% like a goy. What do you expect from him? By the way he presents himself, there's 99. There's never 100% because there always can be exception to the rule. But the way a person dressed and walk, this is who he is. He's not even hiding it. He's not embarrassed. For instance, a person comes to a house of a rabbi without a yarmulke. You expect him to be righteous? You don't need to be a genius to know that he's far away from being righteous. Why? Even wicked people, when they know they come to a house of a rabbi, they come with a yarmulke in their pocket and they put it in before. No? <laughs> I don't remember ever a guest come to me for Shabbat, did not, he forgot to bring a yarmulke. But one of them got caught on the way to the house looking for the yarmulke, and my son already was screaming, Abba, a goy came for Shabbos, a goy. Until today, he reminds me of this. This is like 13 years ago. Remember how your son called me a goy? That's what made him religious at least. <laughs> A one-year-old kid, two-year-old kid he was, he made him religious. Why? He got so embarrassed. A little, little uh, toddler like this calling, calling me a goy, I, I better wake up. You know? Sometimes people say, I came to Shabbat and I became religious, but it's not only the Shabbat who made me religious. I looked at the kids and I realized the only way one day I'm going to have kids like this if I'm going to be like this. There's no surprises. If I won't be like this kind of lifestyle, what, how, what, what kids I expect to have? What kids? All day they see boxing, wrestling, shooting, cursing. What do you expect from these kids to be? 
No, 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 the certain things we don't show them on television, Rabbi. You have cable? Yeah, yeah, but you know, uh, we have a special code. The kids cannot see it. You know, even cartoon, showing cartoon to the kids. Cartoon? What's cartoon? There's a few puppets moving. It's not even real. It can destroy the soul of the kid permanently from what he sees over there. First of all, the language. Second, there's no modesty over there. Male, female, things that kids are not supposed to know they talk about. Third, there's tons of violence. The kids get the impression that if you want to be successful in this life, you have to know how to punch. If you punch good, you're the hero of, this, of the film. That's what they are. They, they, they go to school, and they, then the teacher calls and says, what happened to your son? Everyone who argues with him right away gets one to his face. Where does it come from? It comes from the cartoon. That's what happens in a cartoon, no? I remember when I was a kid, they had cartoon Popeye. The sailor man. What was it all about? He gives him a smack, make him fly to the wind. You know, uh, the next thing he comes, he eats his spinach, he gives him a few punches, and that's how the kids grow up. Or they have these karate uh, movies. You know, Bruce Lee, this, Ninja, Shminja, all this nonsense. All the kids who come out from the theater for, for one week on the street. Ha! Ho! On the street. Everything they see, they kick. Look at the influence that it has on the kids. If, you, if somebody gets into a fight with him, he'll kill him. Why? It happens yesterday in Israel. One kid killed somebody. His father said today it's the influence of that movie. I don't know what the movie. Some movie. He watched the movie an hour before and he killed an hour later. Plus, all these people who make movies, they're very, very selfish. They don't care about the damage that they make to thousands of people. It's a, it's a horrible thing. First of all, they don't care about modesty in their movies. They know there will be kids who watch it. They don't care about this. As long as they can make their money. You understand? So that's what's going on out here. That's maybe the time to tell you that my dear friend Yuval Ovadia, he's the one who makes all the films, all the movies, in the, in the Chuva movement in the last uh, 12 years. Uh, he made up an action movie combined with Kabbalah. Action movie for the theaters. It's going to be all over the world. And it was already accepted to the second biggest festival in the world, in Texas. There's one in Hollywood, it's the biggest. Second one is in Texas. One week before Pesach, they present all the films who got accepted. And this is films that will go to the theaters. And not only that, he even told me a few days ago that before the festival even started, they already informed him that he won some kind of an award. There's different awards. The best film, the best this, the best production, whatever it is. And he claimed, I didn't see them film, I just saw a preview, that it's going to affect millions of millions of people to become more religious, to see the truth. Something with a Mossad agent, that comes and you have inspiration from Hashem. I don't know exactly the story. But one thing for sure, the Goim went crazy when they saw it. Right away they accepted him in days to the festival. He's going to come here two weeks before Pesach and we're going to make a big night. It's going to be, I believe, in Leffert's Boulevard, in Sharei Tovader. Over there, you know that big shul? It's going to be Tuesday night, two weeks before Pesach. We will display the film. He'll have an opportunity to see it before it goes to the theaters. He's the guy that is in charge of all the films that came in the last 12 years in the religious world. The Shata Efes, the Zero Hour, Gog Magog. The truth is that one time I went to give a lecture in Manhattan by a person who used to be my friend. I say, you know, I'm passing by. Let me go see what's, how can I turn this guy to be religious. I come up to his apartment, I see the house is full of guys playing cards. Tables, much like a casino. I walk in, I had my suitcase, in those days I didn't have my laptop yet, it was primitive days, we're talking, uh, I believe, 12, 13 years ago. I had my suitcase with me, and I opened it up, and it's projecting uh, pro overhead uh, transparencies, you know, the clear... Uh, so that's how we used to give the lectures in those days. I walk in with my suitcase, 
I thought maybe I'm going to show some things to my friend. Then it turns that the house was packed with 30 or 40 people. So I'm sitting in the living room, they're all playing cards. Everyone who lose, join me. <laughs> you know, soon I have a group already, we begin to talk, I open my suitcase. Then other people join us, oh, a lecture started. <laughs> he was one of the people there, he was not religious. There was another guy who was very religious, lives here in Main Street today, as a family of religious kids, Baruch Hashem, he was also completely not religious. There was another guy over there, he had a model agency, today is fully religious. There's another guy who had a poker machine in 60 different locations, you know, they, they used to gamble with poker machines, over in the delis, in the pizza stores, he's in Israel today, fully religious. Almost everyone from that night today is fully orthodox. But this guy, the filmmaker, he was the one that after the lecture finished, he took me to the kitchen and we had a talk. I saw that he's very interested. He started to tell me that his grandfather was blind, all day speaking about the Torah. And I invited him for Shabbat, he came to me for Shabbat. By the end of that Shabbat, this is what I like about some people. This is the truth, that's it. I don't care about anything anymore. I don't care what I want to do, what I feel like doing. That's the truth, that's the truth. That's what needs to be done. Motzei Shabbat, he told me, listen, he just made a film that was accepted by, uh, in Hollywood, in a festival, and HBO bought it from him. So I was about to be in HBO. He said, I'm calling up tomorrow my lawyer. I tell him, you can have the movie for yourself. I don't care about my rights. I don't care. I don't want to make money from this kind of movie. Movie, action movie, maybe. It was one of the actors also. I don't want to do anything with this. I said to him, wait, wait, don't rush so fast. Don't jump too high. I'm, I'm selling everything. In two weeks, I'm going to yeshiva in Israel, he said. <laughs> I got nervous a little bit. I said, oh, I hope he knows what he's doing, this guy. Right away. Usually it takes you months for every day, a little more, a little more. You build yourself up right away to jump to be a rabbi. He told me, why, why? If that's the truth, that's it. I'm 36, old, 36 years old. When will I do it if not now? Not 16, 17. As he spoke, that's what he did. He got rid of everything. He left the film to the lawyer. He doesn't even know what happened with that. He went to Netivot Olam in Bnei Brak. Yeshiva, very serious yeshiva for Bale Tshuva, all the pilots, all the, the jet pilots, the F-16, all the, 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 the famous people, the musicians, they're all in that yeshiva in Nebrak. He went there, he learned there for a while, then six months later I went to Israel. He told me, you come, you give a lecture by my parents' house, they have a nice big roof over there in Ramat Gan. I, want, I bring everyone, the whole area, the whole neighborhood, the whole family, everyone comes. I went there, I gave a four-hour lecture, we filmed it with a regular video camera. And then six months after, he calls me up. He said, I prepared a movie. Ah, no, in, the, in between, while he was making the movie, one time he called me, he said, I want all your material. Whatever you have to send me, I want to make a movie. I was laughing, I told him, what movie? Movie about Torah? Because there was no movie about Shuvah in history. Nobody ever made movie. It was on audio tapes. That's it. There was no even CDs. Nothing. Very primitive. Cassettes. CDs. That's all. That's what you can hear. You want to hear Torah? You put the tape in your car. That's it. So he told me, I want to make a movie. I said, what exactly are you going to make a movie about the, the proofs from the seminar? He said, leave it to me. Just send me the stuff. I send him everything. A few months later... He said, I made an unbelievable movie, I'm sending you a copy. Send me a video cassette. I look at that, music, interview people on the street, pictures, everything. I spoke about that lecture. He made it into a movie. Then he put another 15 minutes, life after life, in the end. And that was the first movie who came out in a Jewish history. That was 12 years ago. 12 years ago. Nobody ever thought that movie can make people religious. As soon as we got it out, two weeks later, he said to me, listen, there's a guy here in Bnei Brak. He's the one who distributes all the books, all the audio cassettes. He saw it. He went crazy. He, start, he will start to order 10,000 every month. 10,000 every month. That's how it started to go everywhere. Next thing he calls me up, they decided to put it on prime time in television. 
started to get phone calls from my cousin, my friends in Israel. We're watching you on television, 8, 9 o'clock. That's uh, such blessing this movie had, even though it wasn't done in a studio, it wasn't in the highest quality. But since he talked a lot about science, even the Israeli secular television agreed to put it on. They put it on, and from then, from that moment, everybody realized the potential of the films, and they started to make films. They have hundreds of films. He himself made like 20 films in the last 12 years. Many of them you, are, you saw, Gogu Magog was very famous all over, in English, in Hebrew. And now he made an action movie for theater. Why action movie? Not that that's what he wanted to do. This is the only way you can get to some people that will never come to a lecture or will never go to listen to anything on the internet. Only something actions. Oh, there's a good action film? Through that, he showed them what Torah and Kabbalah is. And Bezrat Hashem, maybe we're going to make a revolution for the second time. But this is it. So remember, two weeks before Pesach, I thought maybe it's the time to promote it now. So let's move back to what I started with. So, you know, we, we actually started now the month of Adar. Second Adar, Adar Bet. Technically, Pesach should have been already in two weeks. Pesach should have been in two weeks. But because of the shortage that it came towards the winter, then we push another month into the calendar and postpone Pesach by another month, because Pesach must fall on the spring always. Chag Aviv. It has to be always in Chag Aviv. And, uh, you know, because it falls on a, on a short, then we, had, we must postpone it, because the Torah call it Chag Aviv. If, if you wouldn't be on a spring, then it would be a mistake in the Torah. So now, because of that, we have Adar Bet. What's the difference between Adar Aleph and Adar Bet? The Gemara says when Adar comes, it's a happy man. Marbim Besimcha. Adar Bet is very interesting, because all the months, in every month you have one special thing you have to be mekaven when you pray in Musaf of Rosh Chodesh. When you pray in Musaf, you know, you pray, you say the bracha, Baruch Atah Hashem, Mechadesh uh, Chodashim, you know, the review, renewing the months. So when you say the name of Hashem, you have to have a special thing in mind. Every month is a different thing, because the name of Hashem has four letters, Yud, Hei, Vav, and Hei. So it, you play with the order of them. One time it's one Hei, uh, Vav, and Hei. Then one time is one Vav, Hei, and Hei. One time is one Hei, Hei, and Vav. One time is Vav, Yud, Hei, and Hei. Hei, Vav, Yud, Hei. Twelve combinations, every month different. Now you may think, ah, big deal, Kavana, not Kavana. The Ariya Kadosh writes that if you don't have Kavana in the Musaf in this name, the whole month, your prayers are not in the same level like they should be. It's affecting the whole month. So every month when we have Rosh Chodesh, it's very important to say, to say this Kavana on Rosh Chodesh. Comes Adar Bet, which is the extra month, and it's not every year, it's every two to three years, it's seven times in 19 years. Every 19 years calendar cycle, we have seven more months that we push into the calendar. What are they? Adar bet. Every two to three years, it falls seven times in 19 years. So what combinations we have Kavana on, on the month of Adar bet? All 12. The month of Adar, all 12. So it's, when you say Baruch Atah Hashem, you have to have quickly in mind all the combination. Yud Ke Vav Ke, Yud Hei Hei Vav, all of them, you write it. And some Sidurim, like the Ashkenazi Sidurs, have it. And some of them, they have in Musaf all the Kavanot. Sfaradis that go according to Kabbalah also has it. Some Sidurim don't have it. Like in my Sidur, I wrote it myself. For every month, what Kavanah it is. Pay attention next time when you get to the next Musaf. It's important, otherwise I wouldn't tell you this. Also... Does the art store have it? Who? The art store? Uh, it's, I, I don't look so much into the art scores because it's more for Americans, but I don't believe that they have it. Okay. It's more to Hasidim, mm -hmm. Sfarad, Nusach Sfarad. The Hasidim goes also a lot by Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. So you can find it over there, and you can find it by the Sfaradim Sidur, some of them. Then, 
I started to say that even in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, they had people who had the guts to come and say that Moshe Rabbeinu, Chas Shalom, is taking some of the money he gets. What's the worst profession for a Jew? To be a gabai, collector of money. Why? Both sides are cursing you. The one who you come to collect money from, oh, here he is again, this guy. <laughs> he said, I'm not here, let me hide. He tells his son, open the door, tell him to come next week. <laughs> so right away, everywhere you go, you know, you're not loved. Unfortunately, it should have been the other way around. Like the Gemara said, one of the Chachamim, when he used to see the Gabbai Tzedakah, he used to run after him. And the Gabbai Tzedakah used to run away from him. He was embarrassed already to take from him. But he ran after him. He said, don't do my calculation with Hashem. He said, no, you know, I'm embarrassed to take from you. I heard that you're telling your son to go to the market to buy the cheapest fruit. So then I assumed that you're not doing so well. We didn't want to knock on your door. He said, this is my everyday life. I live simple. But between me and Hashem, I don't save. Whatever I give, I give the best. Don't make my own... Today it's the opposite. Today, here, take a dollar. You cannot do anything better. It's yeshiva with a dollar. What are we going to do? Hey, don't push your nose into my pocket, okay? <laughs> so, nah. so the people who you collect from, they curse you. The people who you give also curse you. Why? They want more. Why only gave me 20 and I already gave the other gun 50? <laughs> so either way, same thing, shiduch. If you make a shiduch, to someone, find him a soulmate. If the shiduch works out, he say thank you. That's the best you get. If the shiduch doesn't work out, he cares you for how long? <laughs> Depends how long he's married. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all his fault. He never told me about this, he never told me about that. This is it. There are five kinds of people in the world. Let's get serious here now. Five kinds of people in the world. One called Bur. One called Amaretz. We'll explain what each one is. One called Golem. One called Tzadik. And one called Hasid. So you understand that we're going from the bottom to the top, right? Now, in Israel, if you say to an Israeli guy, you're such a golem, that would be the last word you ever spoke to him. Call me a golem, chatzuf. <laughs> but if you only knew a little bit, a little bit what golem means, it would be a very nice compliment. We wish to be a golem. What's a golem according to the Rambam? A golem is someone that has lots of Torah and lots of Midot, but he's not perfect on either one of them. It's not perfect. It needs a correction here and here, but it's in high level. That's golem. <laughs> Today, what, how many Jews can say uh, my, uh, my level in Torah is very high and my level in Midot is very high, but there's some correction that I have to make. You know? What's Bur? Bur, it's like Arava. You know what Arava in Arbat Aminim? Has no taste and no smell. No Torah and no Yirat Shamaim, no Midot. That's Bur. What's Amaretz? Amaretz is like Hadas. Great smell, but no taste. What is it? Has good Midot, but very bad level in Torah. He doesn't know anything. What? All day is cutting hair in his barber shop. He has a nice personality. He doesn't steal. He doesn't speak Lashon Hara, he, like, he likes to help everyone he sees, say hello first. He doesn't have ego, he has a lot of great things about him. You ask him what parasha is this week, he doesn't know. What parasha was last week, he doesn't know. What bracha you say on this, he doesn't know. What, uh, what do we do today, it's Rosh Chodesh Adar Bet, why are you asking me these hard things? He doesn't know anything. That's called Amaretz. But, personality-wise, he loves Hashem. He's trying to do what he knows. The little that he knows, he tries to keep. But the rest he doesn't know. That's called Amaharitz. The third one, as we explained, is a golem. The fourth one is a tzaddik. Tzaddik. What tzaddik is? Tzaddik 
is a person that has great Torah, great level in Torah, and also very high level of midot, but still needs a little correction. It's not, perfectly in a, not perfect in his midot. And Hasid is someone that is perfect in both. Perfect in Torah, very high, and perfect in midot. Even more than the required halacha. Which means, if his worker stole from him, and he fires him, right? He still pay him, even though he can take his money. He say, ah, I don't want to be... I don't want uh, any problems with any person here. I'll give you an example. Rav Moshe Feinstein, you hear about him? He's the biggest Ashkenazi Rav in America, probably in history. I don't think there was ever a bigger Chacham than Rav Moshe Feinstein in the land of America. Maybe I don't know, but to the best of my knowledge, he's the big Chacham. Passed away about 15, 17 years ago, something like that. He was in Lower East Side. There's hundreds of stories that were told about him, about his greatness, but this is a story that not that many people know. It was published in a recent book that came out from one of his students, that published very small books with just mamash, you know, brief notes from the life of Rav Moshe Feinstein. So he said that there was one article, you know, there's American article, Torah article, that people write, weekly or monthly articles, monthly. In this case, it was a monthly article that comes out. And they have a rabbi is right about certain things, opinion, ashkafa, parsha, like many articles that we have today. So there was an article that all they did is criticizing Rav Moshe Feinstein Piske Alacha. Everything he said, they have something to say against him. The one who is in charge of this article criticized him left and right. And they used to send him to his home, this article, and one time they call him up, you didn't make payment for the last six months. He never asked this article. All they do is smashing him, criticizing him in this article, and now they have the nerve to call to ask him to pay the membership. So he told them, how much money I owe you? So they told him how much he owes for the six months. He said, okay, I'm going to pay you the money, but please do not send me this article anymore. So his student asked him, Rabbi, you never ordered this article. You don't have to pay them a penny. You're paying them, they are, all they do is criticizing you left and right, and it's not even Hashem Shamaim. It's not for the sake of heaven. It's somebody that has something against you. He used this newspaper to go to write bad things about you. How do you pay them? He said, according to the Torah, for sure I don't have to pay them. What's the question? But I have a rule in my life. I want to leave this world that not one person has any reason to be angry at me. Doesn't matter if he's right or wrong. I want to be able to go up to heaven when I know nobody has anything to say bad against me. Nothing. He's angry at me. I did this to him. If I don't pay them, they're going to start getting angry, even though I'm right. Of course, they are wrong. I never order it. You can send anything you want to a person and claim payment. Did I order it? Did I ask you to bring it? Why are you bringing it to me? You know, it reminds me about a story that one, one guy went with his wife and children on the street, and then his friend opened up a restaurant on that street, and he's standing by the door of his restaurant. Ah, oh, Moshe, how are you? How are you? A long time no see. Why don't you come? Come in. Look, I just opened this restaurant. It's one week old. Come in. Come. Have a great dinner. No. So this Moshe so inviting us for dinner. Why not? We come in. They eat. The kids eat. Everyone is eating. We say, thank you very much. It's so nice of you. Then at the end of the dinner, he, he hands him a bill. Come, come, be my guest. What be my guest? He sends him a, a bill with no discount. So he said to him, ah, you never told me that I'm going to have to pay. What? It wasn't my plan to go to a restaurant. You, I saw you, a friend. You're inviting me. And now you want me to pay? He said, what do you think? I'm in business to feed the world. What is it? Bet, bet Tamchui? <laughs> you know what Bet Tamchui? Feeding the poor. So they went to court. They went to Bedin, to Jewish court. What do you think was the halacha? He didn't have to pay. Huh? He didn't have to pay. He didn't have to pay? Why he didn't have to pay? He invited him in. 
Well, you know how many people stand on the stores and every one, a person walks by, come in, come in, welcome, come in. Come in means come and give me your money. That's what means come in. So as long as he did not say the word for free, or have dinner on me, or I'm inviting you to, to dinner, which means I pay, then even though you had reasons to assume that he's inviting you for free, but since it wasn't proven 100%, you have to pay. Because of the doubt, you have to pay. Unless if he said for free, then it's called on now already. He said, come, use it. Here, here, take this bottle, drink. Don't worry, for free. You open it, $2. <laughs> Everyone will do it. And there's no end to it. It reminds me about the guy. This one poor guy didn't eat for three days already. Three days. And then he comes, he sees a mezuzah on a big, nice house. He knocks on the door. The owner opens up the door. He says, yes, can I help you? He says, I'm starving. Give me food. I'm dying. So he says, okay, I'll give you food. But you know, by me, no offense. I don't give things for free. You know what? I'll give you, you work two hours by my garage. You clean the garage. I'll give you the best meal you can think of. Whatever you want. Meat, chicken, fish, anything you want, I'll give you. And you can eat as much as you want. The poor guy <laughs> said, two hours to work now, for sure I'll die. But, what, but do I have something better? By the time I find a place to eat, that's my only option. He goes, he says, see all these boxes, put them on the shelves, climb on the ladder, clean all the dust, this, that. He gave him such a job. The poor guy is killing himself. By the end of the two hours he comes, he can barely walk. So give me, give me now the food before I faint. So he said to him, oh, don't worry. You see that, that house across the street? Go inside, the dinner is on the table already, waiting for you to eat. He said, you sure? You're not playing games with me. He said, no, no, don't worry, go inside, you see? Everything you can think of is on the table already. The poor guy comes in, he opens the door, he really sees a nice table, soup, chicken, meat, salads, buffet. He said, well, I wasn't lying. Well, he set up this whole thing just for the two hours I walked. He eats, eats, eats. He puts some in his pocket. He's about to leave. Then somebody from upstairs said, What a chutzpah. Never saw in my life such an ungrateful person. He looks up. He said, What happened? Talking to me? He said, hey, Who am I talking to? My grandma? You just ate here. I don't want to sit like a pig. You ate half of the things that we have here. And not even thank you. You ready to leave? Now the poor guy got angry. So you calling me ungrateful? You have the nerve to talk? I killed myself for this meal. It's not for free. That was the deal, no? So he said, you killed yourself? First time I see your face ever. So what do you mean? I walked two hours, I cleaned your whole garage. So what garage? We don't have a garage here, Bichlal. So I crossed the street. He said, oh, he fooled you also? This guy is a crook. Everyone who comes for donation, poor person, he makes him do some work for him, and then he sends him to us. This is a bet tamchu here. We give food for free all day, all year round. This is the mashal. What's the nimshal? This is what Akadosh Baruch Hu is going to tell each one of us in the day we die, in a trial. The world is bet tamchui. Food is free. I pay it. Now there are two ways to get it. One is to trust me and it comes all the way to your hand, to your door. And one is to go to work to get it. One of the two. If you trust me, don't worry. If the father doesn't want to work, the kids will starve to death? Of course not. Did you ever see a religious person who learns Torah all day, all his life, that ever his kids didn't have what to wear? They're not dressing like the children of Donald Trump or Bill Gates. Fine. Fine. But they dress just as good as most of the ordinary people who goes to work from 7 in the morning to 10 at night. Just as good. I see them all the time. My wife always tells me, you know, this Bliya this Hasidish family, 13 kids, 14 kids, 17 kids in the family. And you see them in a the holiday, top of the line clothing. Top of the line. They don't buy garbage. 
בלי עין הרע, nice thing. If you add together what the kids wear, it's thousands of dollars. And the father learns in kolel. The wife maybe has a job, side job, half a day. A little money from here, a little money from... Nobody, even, nobody can even sit and explain how they live. Most of these hundred thousand people who sit and learn Torah all day. In reality, they all eat in the end. In reality. I can say that in all these years that we have the Yeshiva in Monsi, we have hundreds of hundreds of guys came in without a penny. Without a penny. After learning Torah, they got their soulmates. The time came to get married. One, two, three, everything worked out. Most of them have cars. Most of them pay rent every month. They have everything they need in their home. And they never worked uh, since the time they became religious and learned Torah. They don't work one day. And I know so many people around here that comes to cry to me or call me every day on the phone that they work and they hardly have what to eat. If a person really thinks that the work brings him parnassah, that's where the mistake begins. Work does not bring parnassah. It brings parnassah to those who think that it comes from work. It's all in the head. If you think parnassah comes from work, it would come from work. If you think it comes from Hashem, it will come from Hashem. Now it's up to you. How do you want to get it? You want to put your hand here? You want to put your hand here? You want to get it while you're learning? Or you want to get it while you're working? And staying an extra job, a third job, a fourth job. Remember, to make money, it's only one side. There's also money lost. There's all, it's a balance. You make and you lose. Yes, at work, the more you work, the more you make. But how much you're going to lose is not in your hand. You can make a million dollars this year, and in the end, you're in negative balance. Why? He had so many tragedies and, and, and accidents and problems and works and this and this and that, which in the end, you lost more than what you made. You have employees, you have cars, you have insurance, you have this, you have floods, you have everything, and in the end, you didn't make money. So remember, Parnassah, it's not only how much you make, it's how much you net, how much you have left. Don't ever forget that. There are plenty of from, from men who believe in Hashem and that Lord and still work, so they are wrong? No, I didn't say that. But according to the level of a person, that's how much effort he has to put. You have to remember this. A person can educate himself to be a strong believer in Hashem. And from that moment on, he's going to have few tests. One, two, three, five, ten. Once Hashem sees consistent, he doesn't sell himself for work, for money. First comes the Torah and the mitzvot, then Hashem will take care of all his needs. But if the person only speaks beautiful speeches about emunah, and when it comes to reality, he begins to fight and cares, and is ready to kill someone that he took a dollar from him, or open a store next to him, or anything like this, then he's not, he's not a believer. It's all nonsense. It's just uh, beautiful speeches. You know, some people speak about emunah greatly, but they have zero emunah. Some people do, do not speak about emunah, and they have very high level of emunah. Very high level of emunah. You know what it means when a person has emunah? Let's say he works in a, he's teaching in a yeshiva right now, and he makes a good money. They pay him a good salary, he's a great teacher, he's teaching Torah there. And then he sees something he doesn't like in this yeshiva. Now he has ten kids to feed. And this yeshiva, it's his parnasah. Yeah, whatever he makes, that's, that's the foundation of his living. And he has, to, according to the Torah, what he saw over there, he has to quit right now, not to wait for tomorrow. If I saw what happened in this point, instance, if I see prejudice in a yeshiva, how can I teach in such a yeshiva? If the head of the yeshiva is a prejudiced person, and he, this Jew he likes and this Jew he doesn't like because of his accent or where he comes from or whatever his roots are, huh? there's no permission to even step there. Not forget about to be his worker, to work for him. You serve his agenda is a criminal. So, but what am I going to do? It's my living. Where will I go? That's where emunah comes into place. Someone who has emunah says, Hashem, this is right now the right thing to do. You fed me until today, you will feed me tomorrow and next month. Ah, one month maybe I won't have until I find another job. Maybe it will take three months. Why am I worried? Is it more difficult for you to feed me somewhere else than here? 
when I do what you want me to do? What's the question? I told you the story about the, the Avrech in Switzerland, no? All his years he was learning Torah. And his wife from time to time comes to him and says, what are we going to do? We have to marry the kids. One wedding after the other every year. Where are we going to get all that money? We have 14 kids. Do you have enough money saved that I don't know about for 14 weddings? Because maybe it's about time for you to go to work, to find some kind of a job. So he told her, I don't understand. All these years we raised the children. We brought them to where they are without working. I was only learning Torah. Now, I don't understand. Now you expect me to leave because you think that up to now Hashem could protect us and support us. And from now on he has problem. He won't be able to support us. For Hashem, it's more difficult to get me instead of 10,000 a month, 20,000 a month, or 50, or a million. What is it for him? The papers is heavier. It's harder to produce. The United States government produces $10 billion every day printing money. Hashem cannot give me money. What's the problem? You know, so the wife relaxed a little bit. And tomorrow she comes back again with the questions. Then, one day they get a letter from the Federal Court of Switzerland. We are invited to be in court 9.30 in that date. No explanation for what. I don't have to tell you, in a country like this, when you get a letter to come to the federal court, you're shaking. His wife, oh, who knows, who knows what happened? Did you do something? No, what, what did I do? All day I go to yeshiva, I learned from morning to night, I come home. What do I have? I didn't do anything. You did? No, it's maybe a mistake. He said, no, it's our names here. We have to come to court. For one man, they were very nervous. He comes to court. He comes inside. He sees the judge looking at him. You, Mr. Such and Such? Yeah. The judge is smiling. It's, it's your lucky day today. Your lucky, my lucky day in a court with the goyim. <laughs> he said, what happened, your honor? <coughs> he said, you are a very rich man as of now. You have to sign the paper and you become the richest man in Switzerland. Uh, what happened? <laughs> he said, do you know Mr. Such and Such? Some goy. Never heard of him. You do not know who he is? He's the biggest businessman in Switzerland that just died a few weeks ago. Never heard of him. Sorry. Psh. He has all the hotels. He has this. He has this. Well, it's all yours. Come sign the papers and you are inheriting all his wealth. He wrote in his will, since he doesn't have children, that when he dies, all his money must be given to the biggest family in Switzerland that has the most kids. Since he couldn't have kids, he wants the family that have the most kids. Now, that at least his money will go to a good use. We checked in the entire country, and you are the biggest family in Switzerland. <laughs> Nobody has 14 kids. If they only knew one day they can get it, they couldn't believe it. It looks like a joke. He became a billionaire. And his wife was telling him for years, years, leave, leave the kolel, leave the yeshiva. Imagine if we'd listen to her. I gotta work, make a thousand, two thousand dollars a month. For sure he wouldn't get this, this money. The only reason Hashem put in the head of this guy to write this in the will for him. He knew it's going to him, the money. You understand? Some people would be very upset to win all this money. Don't be so excited. You know why? Because when you get such a huge amount of money in your lifetime, when you get some of could be, could be very, very likely that Hashem pays you in your lifetime for your mitzvot. So give it to... Sir. It's not a, yeah, so it's not a good idea. So if you, if... A smart person will take some of it to his needs, and the rest will only do mitzvot with. Why? It's very not logical that a person reach certain age, and the last 10 or 20 years of his life, all of a sudden Hashem makes him a billionaire. If he's a not religious person, it's very logical. He made few mitzvot, Hashem wants to get rid of him, he pays him in his lifetime. But if he's a tzaddik, person who learns Torah, person who does mitzvot, all of a sudden, boom, $300 million in a lottery. It's not a good sign. I knew a guy that was a, an American Jew from Pennsylvania 
that uh, he met me through the internet, he started to listen to my lecture, him and his wife, Baruch Hashem, became very religious, and they moved to Israel now. Now they went to move in Israel. Uh, but before, many years ago, before he even became religious, he, was a, he had a business of fireworks. And he used to make shows, big shows, 4th of July, you know, fireworks. And he got Chinese fireworks made in China. And when he prepared that big show, one of them exploded in his face. Like a bomb. It's, it's, it's fireworks, not for a little neighborhood. Fireworks for the whole city. It's not much. An explosive inside. Some kind, something went wrong in the manufacturer. It was a manufacturer defect. It exploded in his face and made him 99% dead. He was in a hospital almost dead for, for, for a long time. Somehow, the, he, he got his life back. But he's very, very limited now. You know, in some parts of his body, he cannot move. He's talking about that Chaz Shalom is the last year of his life. That's how bad he feels. And he's, he's a young person. He's not even an old person. Anyway, he sued the Chinese government. Before he was religious, he won $10 million on a lawsuit, which is peanuts compared to how much they really had to give him. But $10 million he won. And then they appeal, and he won again. They appealed again, the Chinese government, because you know, in China everything owns by the government almost. So even this company owns by the government. So the Chinese government against one Jew. And they appealed again, and he once again. Nine times they keep dragging him from one court to another. <coughs> the same judge is in charge of his case. Nine times the same judge made him win the case. Just when he became very religious, it was one last appeal. That's it. It's either everything or nothing. He lost everything by the same judge. Wow. It was a different judge, different country, different court. They dragged him to China. No. So logically, you understand. Over here, they think he's, he deserved the money. Over there, same judge, same case, same everything. Over the years, nine times he wins. Just he became very religious, he lost everything. What's the answer? Very simple. If you know a little Torah, you know. Before he became religious, Hashem had plans to get rid of him. No share to the world to come. Echal Shabbos, eat rabbits, eat pork, eat whatever he eats. You want to have the world to come? Forget about it. Now... After you became religious, I don't want to give you the $10 million because I'm not planning to get rid of you. I want to give you life of eternity full of pleasures as I promised. What's the point of giving you $10 million here for what? If I'm paying you for your mitzvot here, for the few mitzvot you did in your life, then I cannot pay you again. I'd rather take away what I was about to give you because you changed my plan, you made tshuva. This is how it works, for good and for bad. Sometimes it's supposed to make it, and Hashem takes it away from you. I just came now from a meeting with another young guy in his 30s. He told me today, we, we sat today together. As soon as I saw him, I saw that he's very upset. He said, what the day I had? I said, what? He said, I lost a million dollars today. Me and my brother. I told him, you lost a million dollars? So he said to me, yes, it's a deal that we've been working five months from morning to midnight on it. We were supposed to do the closing today and get the million dollars. And in the last minute, the deal fell apart. After all, everything was done. That's it, just to, get, to sign the paper and get the money. Everything went up. We said, my brother is killing himself. But he still came to meet with me as we planned. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I wanted to cancel the meeting. But he insisted to make the meeting while knowing it's probably the worst day of his life, financially. So I told him, let me explain to you something. Money that a person was supposed to make, and in the end it fell apart, it's not money that he lost. It's true that it's preventing him from making the profit, which in, the, in reality is almost the same. What's the difference? Either way, you're supposed to get the million dollars and you lost it. But money that never came to your hand, 
Money that came to your hand, that means Hashem wanted this money to be in your position. You, the owner of this money, and for whatever reason, he took it away from you. Then it's, you can call it a loss. You had it, and Hashem took it away from you, and you got your punishment. However, money that it only looked like you're going to make, eh, tomorrow morning the guy promised you the check, come meet me at 9 o'clock. All these things that looks like you're going to make it, 90%, 80%, 70%, whatever it is. Or you walk on a deal in real estate and boom, in the last, in a closing, something goes wrong and you lose the deal. Or the customer already taking all kinds of stuff and all of a sudden his credit card does not work. Okay, I'm going to have to come back next week and he never shows up. It happens. This was all an illusion. It was never meant to be. Hashem only did it to you to hurt you to wake up. It was, he had no plan to give it to you. He had no plans to give it to you. So don't eat your heart. Oh, I had a million dollars. You can only be upset that you thought that you're going to make it. That's it. But the reality, it was never yours. There's a big difference. That's why the punishment of preventing profit from a Jew is not the same like stealing from him. When in reality, it should have been the same, no? If I went to a store and stole $100 from his cash register, what's my punishment? If I get caught, I have to give him 200 right? If I stand by the door, and a person who came with a $100 bill to buy this jacket, it's $100. He comes to buy the jacket, and I stand by the door, and I say, hey, don't buy this jacket. It's garbage. Go over there, they sell it for much cheaper. And they don't walk in. They turn around, and he went to another store. Didn't I just take $100 from him? If I got caught, I'm supposed to give him 200 no? No. I'm guilty in heaven, yes, but they're bad in here. They cannot take 200 away from me. Why? Because it never got to his hand. There's no indication that he would get to his hand. Only money that became yours officially, it's yours. Everything else is an illusion. That's why in America, I think they say, we only count the money when we have it in our hand, no? Not promises, this, that. Promises. Promises never end. So the fifth kind is a chassid. Chassid does lifni mishurat adin. The Gemara says, Rav Una, I think, he had 400 barrels of wine. And the, and the goyim that used to work for him, they did some kind of damage. They broke one. They wanted them to pay for it. So in the end, you know, they, they, took, they took him to the base dean, and he says, uh, you, have to, you know, he said, well, he made me a damage. Why should I pay for it? So in the end, they say, well, he said, uh, do you, are you clean? The damage that happened to you, you know you're clean. You never made any sin. So he started to think, he said, why, you know anything that I did wrong? So he said to him, well, maybe, maybe you didn't pay all the money that you owe to your workers? He said, no, I always pay everything. So then they started to think, and he said, there's one worker who, know, who stole money from him. So he didn't pay him just to get back what he stole from him. Not that he took from the worker. The worker stole, and it was, so, let's see, somebody stole from you $200, and you, you owe him $200, and you call him stealing from your store $200. You don't have to give him the $200, you keep the money. For the 200 he stole from you. You have position of this money, what, well, you're going to give it to him and expect him to give you back? There's one case like this about Reuven that uh, took money from Shimon and never paid it back. And then this Reuven is in some yeshiva, and this Shimon, that this Reuven owe him $200 and play games with him, somebody came to this Shimon and said, are you learning this yeshiva? He said, yes. Do you know this person by such and such name? Yes, Reuven. He said, we want to send him $200 donation. Can you give it to him? He said, sure. He took the money. Now he's starting to think. He said, hey, this guy owe me $200. Isn't it from Hashem? The money that they were supposed to, from all the 500 people learning this yeshiva, who do they come to? To me. To give me this money that I'm going to take it. You know, and that's it. I won't ask for the 200 but then he started to think, maybe it's a test for me. 
Maybe I have to give it to him and ask him, here, you see, I'm nice to you. Here is your 200 that somebody sent to you. Now pay me back your 200. What do you think the halacha is? Is he allowed to keep it or he has to give it to him? He has to give it to him. Huh? You won't be a good judge. You don't go with your heart. You have to go with the truth. The truth is it's his money, of course. Money came to your hand. Some say not only if, my, if his money comes to your hand, you're allowed to take it. Some say you're allowed to do something to get it out of him. You can go and get it out of him. I don't want to tell you the expression the Gemara used. Break his teeth and take it. If that's what needs to be done. But you didn't hear it from me. You understand? Why? It's a favor to him. You see, you, the thief think that if they got caught and they, took, and they took the money away and gave it back to the person, that they unlucky. Ah, bad luck. How did they catch me, this lousy camera? <laughs> they don't know that it's the, in this situation it's the best thing could have happened to them. But it's better to come to Hashem and now Hashem show you that you owe money to this person? You have to be reincarnated again to pay him back in another life? You cannot ever enter to heaven if you have stolen money by you. I'm not talking 50 cents, a dollar, a quarter that a person forgive. Somebody gave you two dollars and you were supposed to give it to him and then you never saw him ever again. I don't know, he moved, he never showed up anymore. This is money that people don't care. If you call him and say, forgive me for that, he said, don't bother, just keep it. I know there are crazy people who for, for, for 50, 25 cents, coupons that they have, they spend five dollars gas to drive all the way to Costco with two dollars coupon. Five dollars gas, ten miles away, twenty miles back and forth is five dollars gas. No, it's a gallon gas. Two dollars coupon. I'm not exaggerating. You see them. You see them. Sometimes you go to do shopping for Shabbat. You see, they buy two items. They came for the coupon. Who drives to such a big department store to buy two items because of the coupons? You wonder to yourself what's going on, <laughs> what's going on here. That's sick people. Somebody like this, you owe him a penny for 20 years, he's seen and waits for it. Don't leave the house, maybe he will give back the penny. <laughs> We're not talking to people like this. We're talking normal people. Normal people, up to a few dollars, nobody cares. Right? If a person gave you the pen and accidentally you forgot to give it back and you got on a plane. If you call him from Israel, hey, I have your pen, what is he going to tell you? Send it FedEx? <laughs> Keep the pen, two dollars, who cares? No? Huh? That's it. So things like this is nothing to worry so much. Even though in our yeshiva, if you put your pen on a table, nobody will use your pen. Unless if they ask you permission. Why? The ink costs money. How much? A penny. I'm not touching. Just you, just write the number, no, I'm in a rush. It's not my pen, I don't touch. You got it? But that's called Midat Hasidut already. That's Midat Hasidut. Four different categories of opinionated people we have. People with opinions. Well, I should say not opinions, behaving. Noach likos, venuach leratzot. People who in, in less than a second, they go on flame, on fire. One word you made, what? <laughs> right away, they, they grab the knife. Oh, no, no, I apologize. Okay, okay, forget, forget that it happened. In less than a second, he was ready to kill you. In less than a minute, he forgot. He shook your hand, and it's all over. That's one category. What's the second category? The Gemara said this, Yatsas charo beefsedo. Penoni. It's not so good, not so bad. Why? Because he's willing to forgive very easily. That's good, but get angry so fast, it's very bad. So, okay. Kashe likos ve kashe leratzot. Very hard to make him angry. Cold as ice, this person. But if you finally get him angry, oh, wow, years you have to beg for forgiveness. <laughs> Took him years to be angry, but now it's going to take years to make him forget. Yatsaev sedo beskharo, also mediocre. Good. The good part is that it's very difficult to get him angry. He's not a fool. Every little thing he gets angry. Really, really something bad you did, he gets angry. <laughs> I remember one time I gave a ride from Monsi to Queens. Somebody came to the yeshiva 
and he wanted to go visit his parents. So I told him, I came to the place where I was supposed to give the lecture. <laughs> and, I, and, he said, and I said to him, wow, I mean, I'm late. I can't find parking. So he was supposed to get off where I'm giving the lecture, and somebody's supposed to come pick him up from where we are. So he told me, <laughs> do you want me to park the car for you? I said, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good idea. He saved me 10 minutes. I go quickly, I start the lecture. I'm talking, talking, an hour, an hour and a half. He doesn't come give me the key. At one point in the lecture, I forgot about it already. I'm in the lecture. Now the two hours are gone. I come, I wear my coat. Where is my key? Where is my key? Wait a minute. What happened with this guy? I gave him the key, he never showed up. Now I know the guy. I know. What happened? Maybe something happened. Police, accident, even around the block. I go down, I look for the car, nothing. One hour, two hours, already midnight. I have to make phone calls, somebody knows where he is, I call his place. I... Then in the end, what happened? He, he took my car and he drove to where he was supposed to go. Without <laughs> permission. And in the end, I said to him, okay, you stole the car without permission. Return the car to here, I'm in the street. No, I parked the car. Uh, wait a minute, he doesn't remember where he parked the car. <laughs> Until 1.30 at night, we had to go look for the car. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do to a guy? Now I have to return him to Monsi. Sit an hour and a half with him in the car. <laughs> what a test. That's harder than the incident. <laughs> Not only that's Ratzachta Megav I have to deliver him back home. <laughs> that's a test. Something like this, you got angry. No, at least you have a point. But every little thing today, oof, ah, dear, what happened? No, that's kashe lichos ve kashe liratzot. Kashe lichos ve noach liratzot. Someone is very difficult to get him angry. But even finally when he got him angry, in five minutes, he forgets about it. Okay, no, I'm working on myself. I forgive you. Mechila, no problem. What what do you call somebody like this? Hasid. Remember, Hasid is the fifth level. Someone who gets angry very fast. Like in Israel, you have people. You ask him, "How are you, Jojo?" In the morning, it's none of your business. <laughs> Tell him, "How are you?" Don't ask me again. <laughs> Don't look at me. You know. Noach lichos vekashe leratzot rasha. Not only right away he goes on fire, finally come, you ask him mechila, it's his fault. <laughs> he make a whole show. No, not mochel, not forgiving. That's a rasha, wicked. One king that was an angry person, he knew that he has this problem. He knew it, that's his problem, he has to work on it. So he told his servant, take the whip out of my room and hide it very far in the palace, all the way in the other side. Every time I get angry and I want to hit, whip one of my servants, I'm going to have to run all the way to the other side of my mansion and get the whip and come all the way back. By the time I run back and forth, it relaxes me. So I don't want to hit him anymore. Why? If the whip will be here... Right away, he's going to hit him. Then by the time he's going to relax, it'll be too late. So by the time he used to run, every time it happened to him, he runs to get the whip, he gets to the whip, he says, ah, what's the point? <laughs> he comes back without it. That's a clever person. Ah, he knows the only way to handle my situation is to make some kind of a protection. There's, there's other ways. I always tell people, make a box, stack a box with penalty. You have this problem, so you, you make now a promise. Every time you do the same thing, you put X amount of money, something that hurts, not 50 cents. Uh, 50 cents doesn't hurt. Right? Something that hurts you. I don't know, $10, $20, whatever, according to how much you make every day. And then every time you do, for instance, Lashonara, 10 bucks. Ugh. Then five minutes later, your wife, so what happened with that guy? He didn't finish the story. 
five, ten. I had one, I used to, I used to penalize people in my lecture many years ago when I was young, <laughs> you know. So every, every, I said to the people, you want to stay in the lecture? Because, you know, dealing with Israel is not nice, nice like you, you're sitting, doesn't, don't make a beep. It's a big war, fighting, arguing. Every five seconds, somebody else jump and scream. So I say, you know, we cannot go on like this with the lecture. From now on, I put a box in a thing. Everyone who bothers me in a lecture, five dollars in a box. And the money goes to the yeshiva. At least, at least something good will come out of your interference here. <laughs> so I had one guy, he said, okay, Rabbi, <laughs> here, 20 bucks. Four times, you know, <laughs> four times in advance. <laughs> I said, I'm making this penalty to prevent problems. You're already buying four times. <laughs> <laughs> Then, you know, they say about Socrates. You heard about Socrates? Socrates. In Greek, you say Socrates, not Socrates, like in English. It's Greek. <laughs> <laughs> so, he was a Greek scholar, a very smart person. And he had a very wicked wife, very wicked. And she made his life very bitter. But he was very, very calm doesn't ever scream, doesn't get angry. She screams all day, he doesn't answer. You know, you know, when a person is crazy and he screams and the spouse doesn't answer, it makes them more angry. Do! Scream! Do something! They want for attention, you know? They want attention. He doesn't make a beep. She screams, she screams. One time she decided to teach him a lesson. So she was uh, sponging the floor. So she took the bucket full of water and she came while he was learning with his books. She spilled everything on his head. He all got wet. So she thought by now he's going to get up and give her a smack or something. So he got up. He said, wow, nature never lies. Usually always after the thunders comes the rain. <laughs> he screamed. Now came the, after the thunders you have rain. <laughs> you know. You know, the Rambam one time heard that there's a goy, that this goy is amazing. What kind of personality this goy has? What a behaving. What a bal chesed is. Honest. Mamash never gets angry. So the Rambam said, you know, I gotta go and check how can it be. It cannot be a person will be perfect without Torah. We don't find things like this. That's, with, with Torah, Someone who learns a lot of Torah, Musar, over the years he becomes perfect. But someone without Torah, there has to be something bad about him. It has to be, it cannot be. I gotta go and check. He comes to this guy. Yes, my name is Moshe. Yes, I'm passing by. I'm looking for a place to sleep. People in town told me you're a very generous person with great hospitality. Would it be fine that I'll stay by you for a week? That's already a first test. So the guy said to him, of course, Jewish rabbi, come, give me your bag. Here is your room. No problem. I'll take care of glad kosher for you. Don't worry. The rabbi said, oh, started good. Well, rabbi, where do you want me to buy the food? In this store, in that place? Tell me. And the Rambam sits there all day, following him. He see, this person is great, really great behaving, like, the, like everyone says. After a week, the Rambam came to him and said, you know, I'm very impressed from your hospitality. You're a great human being. I, in all my life, I didn't believe that without learning Torah, a person can read such level like you. But I have a very, very big doubt now about the Torah, the Rambam told him. He said, the Torah say that nobody in the history was more humbled and will never be more humble than Moshe Rabbeinu, than Moses. In my own eyes, I saw that you are more humble than Moshe. And you didn't even speak to God. So the guy said, Rabbi, can I tell you a secret? This question that you just raised bothers me for the last 20 years. So the Rambal said, ah, thank you, I got my answer. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> the guy said, Rambal told him, you're more humble than Moshe. 
So instead of saying, no, God forbid, you're comparing me to Moshe, come on, Rabbi, don't exaggerate. I'm not the dust in his shoe. So he said, yeah, this, this dilemma, this question that you have bothers me for 20 years. 20 years he thinks is Mr. Big Shot. So the Rambam says, yeah, from the outside it's very nice. The inside, it's what matters. Inside is rotten. Ego. <laughs> Four different categories of students. Ma'er lishmoa ve ma'er le'abed. Understand everything they hear quickly. Five minutes later, they don't remember anything. It's like in my lectures. Rabbi, it was a great lecture. Five minutes later, his wife tells him, can you tell me what you heard in the lecture? No, I don't know. I know it was very strong. <laughs> he only remembered the joke. If there was a joke. Not, not any achievement. Very difficult for him to understand, but when finally he understand, ten years later he still remember. Why? Why? He went over it 20 times, now he remember. It's also mediocre, because until he understand, he wastes a lot of time. Right away he understand, and he doesn't lose it. Very rarely he forgets things. That's a chacham, that's a real chacham. Kashel ishmoa, Vemaer le'abed zeksil, a fool. Not only he doesn't understand anything, finally he finally understands something, an hour later we come back to him, no, what did I teach you? I tell you the truth, I don't remember. The Gemara said there was Rabbi Freda, he had a student, every day he was teaching him the same page in the Gemara 400 times, from morning to night, 400 times. One time he came, he said, hey, listen, today I have an important business meeting in the afternoon. Maybe you put extra concentration, we'll finish a little bit earlier today. <laughs> Try to understand, okay, focus. After 400 times, he hopes that after 300 times, the student will say, okay, Rabbi, you can go, I, I, I'm okay. 350, 380, 400 times! The rabbi said, okay, well, 400 times, like every day, but at least you got it, huh? So, rabbi, I'll tell you the truth, I'm embarrassed, but I didn't get anything today. He said, just today when I need to go, you didn't understand, it. every day you understand by 400. He said to him, Rabbi, from the minute you told me that you're in a rush to your business meeting, I couldn't think anymore from the pressure. <laughs> it happens to people. It happens a lot to people. Once you put them under pressure, that's it, they cannot think. So Rabbi Fred, I had to go to an important business meeting. There's no, like today, cell phone, text. I have a moron in my class. I'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> what are you going to do? You're stuck there. The person is waiting. He said, let's sit from the beginning and learn the whole thing. He told him again 400 times. He didn't go to the meeting. Much like the rabbis today. <laughs> 400 times extra. You know, I heard a, a beautiful say, very sad, but very sharp. They said, in the previous generations, the rabbis used to be people that their head is full and their pockets are empty. Today, it's people who, who's becoming rabbis, it's people that their head is empty and their pockets are full. Why? Everyone has money, right away, a million dollars, he buy a place, build himself a building, synagogue, fundraising, dinner, Up, oh, he has a beautiful, fancy building, and he makes himself the rabbi. Two or three years later, collection, up, 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 he takes his 20 years old son, he makes him a rabbi of another shul. How much Torah they know? Not one gram of Torah, nothing. They don't know anything. Or what the average student in yeshiva, they don't even know. Everything you ask them, they have a great answer. Machloket. <laughs> Depends. According to one opinion, is allowed. According to one opinion, is not allowed. Call me back tomorrow, I'll give you an answer. <laughs> Somehow they, they pulled the, the scam 20 years. 
But in the old days, there's nothing like this to ask a rabbi a question and he doesn't, right away, they know everything according, that's it, what do you think? It's a different world. Anyway, so the student, Ma'er le'abed, kashe lishmoa, ma'er le'abed, not only doesn't understand quick, finally when he understand, he forget, that's called exil. That's what we say in, uh, in Teilim. We say in Teilim, Ish ba'ar lo yeda. Ish ba'ar, what's ba'ar? Ba'ar is a foolish person. Uchsil lo yavin et zot. Chsil, I don't know the right word in, 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 in if you have fool, fool, what's worse than a fool? A moron is worse than a fool or better than a fool? If you say a person a fool, what's going to be worse word than a fool? No, you Americans, you should help. Moron is stronger. Moron is stronger than a fool, right? It's like pulling a person real down, no? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. All right, so here, a, a, a fool is uh, someone who does, is not so clever. Uchsil. Seal is a complete moron that nothing he understand. Lo yavin et zot. Will not understand this. The, what? Will not understand what? Befroach reshaim kmo esev. When the wicked people are popping everywhere in the world like the weeds. The weeds in the garden, quickly one or two days you don't take care of the weeds, everything become weeds. All over you go, the whole grass became weed. It's a cancer. There's no way to stop it after a while. Befroach reshaim kmo esef. The wicked people are popping everywhere, in the media, everywhere you go, in the newspaper, on the streets. Eh, millions. Vayatzitzu kol poale aven. Those who are the worst are on the top of the pyramid. Everywhere you go. In the media, in, the in politics, in the government, here. Everywhere you go. What's this all for? What's the end of this verse? Leisham dam adead vayatzitz ukol po ale aven leisham dam adead to destroy them for eternity. That's the end of the verse. Which means, why do I let them succeed here and control the media, this, that, on the streets and jobs, everywhere you go, why? Leisham dam adead because anyway they have no share to the world to come. So let them at least enjoy 20, 30 years here. The nice car coming to their garage. Psh, it's all opened up. Water fountain. They say, Sir, can I take your jacket? Yeah, what's for dinner? Bow tie, the way they're cut for him. Beautiful. He, he thinks, ah, oh, I'm an American dream. American success. If a person knew where he's heading to, he wouldn't be able to enjoy this tech. Unless if he's Adolf Eichmann, he machshimo. One hour before they hung him, he asked for a steak and a red wine. And was reading a German newspaper in Germany, how they describe his hanging. So the Rav Shach, will finish with this, Rav Shach said one time in his lecture in Ponovich Yeshiva, he said, what's the difference between a Jew to a Nazi, to a, to a dirty Nazi? What's the difference? A Jew comes the month of Elul, one month before Rosh Hashanah. It's plenty of time to correct. This whole month of Elul, we can correct a lot, no? We make tshuva, tshuva, tshuva. We can erase all the sins from the previous year. And we come clean to the trial. So we have a lot of time, and we know Hashem for sure will forgive us if we make tshuva and correct our bad ways. For sure. It's not like the judge here, they'll give you a little discount maybe. But you must pay for your sin. You killed... You say to the judge, I made tshuva, I regret, I will never do it again. The judge says, okay, 20 years instead of 25. It has to send you to prison, that's the law here. I didn't pay electric for 20 years. Okay, your honor, from now on I'll pay my electric bills. Wave everything until now, let's start fresh. Tshuva, no? Over here it doesn't work. So Rav Shach says, a Jew just here Elul, he faints. That's how it was in his time. Today nobody faints. But in his time, when they say, Elul! Half of the people in the shul, boom, their head bang on the floor. No, not exaggeration. 20, 30 years ago, that's how it was. Just they say, Elul, the month of preparation for the judgment day start, people will faint. They get panicked. Attacks. 
So he says, this monster, an hour before they kill him, instead of saying, I apologize, forgive me for what I did, I wish I could not do it, I wish I would not have done it, well, something, even a fake. Sits with a newspaper in his room, ask for a steak and a glass of wine. They're going to make a shish kebab from you in 20 minutes. You're eating steak, that's what you care about? The three minutes that you're going to bite from this lousy steak? One good thing came out of it, that the person who hung him was a Yemeni Jew, not religious. Hagar, his name was. After he hung him, he became religious. So even this monster made one Jew religious. It obligates us to make much more, no? If he made one Jew religious, how did he make him religious, do you know? I told that once in the lecture. When he hung him, he didn't know that he's going to have to take him down and burn his body. They only told him after he hung him. Hagar, torid oto achshar. Take him off. He said, he didn't tell me I have to take him off. There's one thing to pull the rope around him and push the chair down. That's one thing. To pick him up, the dead body, it's much more scary. They told him, amatchil ba mitzvah, omrim lo gmor. You start the mitzvah, you must finish it. So he said, okay, I'll take him. Now he was standing on a chair. What does he have to do? He has to hold him from the stomach and pick him up about, you know, I don't know, 10, 10 inches up and then pull him from the rope because he's hanging on the rope. So he has to open the knot. He has to pick him up and take him down. But he didn't know, Hagar, he didn't know that when a person dies, the last breath that he took never comes out of the body. It stays in the body. We breathe, and we release the air. And then we breathe again, and we release the air. So when a person died, after he, he was just breathing deeply, up oh, and he died. All the air stayed in the lung. It doesn't, doesn't come out. So what happened is, when he pressed, all the air came out of his mouth. And he was looking in his horrible eyes, if you remember his face, this monster killer, Mamash from five inches away I was picking him up. <laughs> and he went like this. Oh, he screamed. The air came out of his mouth. And he thought he came back to life. And he fell on the floor with him. They both fell. <laughs> and one month, one year, I'm sorry, he was in a hospital, mental hospital. He couldn't get out of this situation. Slowly, slowly he recovered. And then he made tshuva. He made one Jew one tshuva. The Gemara says, Haman, his grandchildren learning Torah in Bnei Brak. The Gemara says. So everybody asks, Haman? It's like saying the grandchildren of Ahmani Jad became Jews sitting in Yerushalayim and learning Torah. What merit this monster has that his grandchildren learn Torah? The answer is, the Jews, so many of them became religious from the fear from that monster that even though he's wicked and Hashem doesn't want to give him any reward, his grand-grandchildren will benefit from it. Why? My children became religious from this monster. It was also good. Needless to say, if a righteous person makes him religious, it's much, much better. If a horrible monster like this uh, Iranian midget and this Haman and Pharaoh and all these people, if they make Jews religious, it helps them. And needless to say, if we're going to make Jews religious, how much is going to help us, no? It's needless to say, it's Kalvachomer. Let's just do it. Thank you very much. We'll see you next Wednesday.